Father McMorrow, thank you, and thank you for uh, your efforts in helping us to put this all together this evening. And at the beginning, a word of thanks also to the staff of the conference who in so many ways has uh, worked to facilitate putting on these talks, not only for those of us who are here, and again, what a nice turnout this evening, uh, but by the streaming and the ability even later on to follow this, uh, people who are not able to be here in this part of the diocese or even in our own part of the country uh, are able to watch this. As I said at the beginning, the lecture series here was conceived as an effort to try and help fulfill what Pope Emeritus Benedict asked us to do for this year, which was to enter into a year of faith, to find that means to sort of awaken once again that tremendous fervor that should be so characteristic of our Catholic faith, to arouse in us again that pride, that love of the meeting in the person of Jesus Christ through our Catholic faith. That's what this is all about. And in a particular way, the Holy Father, among other things, asked us to do several things. One of them we're doing outside, and I'm particularly grateful. He asked that this year have a particular witness of charity. And we've done this associated with the different talks so far, and uh, I know that there is the collection going on for the uh, articles, the uh, 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 hygiene articles and so on, uh, as a part of the collection. This is, too, a small uh, token example of what the Holy Father has asked us to do in the course of this year of faith, that we witness again in charity to who and what it is we are to be the hands of Christ. The centerpiece of what the Holy Father asked of us was that we should have um, a closer relationship to the Second Vatican Council. He asked us to use this year to read the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And so this lecture series with speakers coming in with expertise in the particular areas is intended to try and fill in as well behind some of the efforts being made in many of our parishes with the adult education where even our pastors and our priests are sitting down and helping us to go through some of the documents and reacquaint ourselves or maybe acquaint ourselves for the first time. You know, so many Catholics, when it got to Vatican II, they saw this book that was so large and they got a little intimidated by it. Or maybe it's something that they read early on and didn't come back to. So here's an opportunity for us to break that open again, to come back into it. Uh, we began uh, with a talk by Bishop Arthur Kennedy from Boston, which attempted to set the circumstances for the Second Vatican Council. First called in 1958, convened in 1962. What were the historical circumstances? What led up to it? What was the reasoning, the thought behind the, uh, the uh, effort of uh, Pope John XXIII to convene the, uh, the council. The second talk uh, was several weeks ago by Bishop William Murphy uh, of Rockville Center, basically Long Island now in New York. And he presented to us one of the great constitutions, Lumen Gentium, Christ the Light of the World. And arguably, in a point that he made, it is the document that allows us to interpret, to understand the rest of the documents in the Second Vatican Council because it is the document on the church herself. What is our self-understanding as members of the church? Once having that, we can then go through the other documents from that perspective and see and read and understand the, um, the different aspects. Today, we are going to be engaged in another of the great constitutions, Lumen Gentium, the Church in the Modern World. Pope Emeritus Benedict made a strong point throughout his pontificate of eight years to talk about the Second Vatican Council. And one of the points that he made was that one of the great questions for calling the Second Vatican Council was to say, how is the church going to meet the changes of this new and modern and evolving world that you and I are now 
so much in the midst of. He was coming from his own historical perspective, well studied, as well as his lived perspective. As you know, he came out of Germany, the time of uh, National Socialism, the Nazis, the Second World War, the catastrophe of the destruction and the suffering that he saw and that uh, he lived through. And his own feeling and explanation at one of the great issues was not that we are to change the faith, we're never to do that, it's always the faith, the faith of Christ. But how is that faith to be re-articulated for our time in a way that will be understood and received and loved by the era that we're in? You know, we're in a time now of iPads and iPhones and all kinds of things. To speak of the faith in the same way that we did 50 years ago is to be behind the times. And so the whole question of the church engaging the modern world is such an important task. For that reason, uh, I've asked and invited and am very privileged to have uh, Miss Nancy Wisdo come and speak to us about Gaudium et Spes, about the church in the modern world and about that document. Uh, Nancy has a tremendous background in the life of the church, in love for the church, in service to the church. She's a native of Pennsylvania, the Diocese of Harrisburg. She did her educational background work in sociology and in social work, and following that spent 15 years at Catholic Charities, beginning as a caseworker and uh, concluding that service as an assistant uh, director. She also led the pro-life, the family life, and the social justice uh, efforts for the Diocese of Harrisburg. She was named at a certain point a member of the Catholic Campaign for Human Development's National Committee and went on then to become the Director of Domestic Policy for the bishops in the United States. Uh, that's a very short term for a job with a tremendous amount of responsibilities. She was recognized and then appointed to a term on the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace in Rome. In 2005, she became the Associate General Secretary and directed the conference's public policy and domestic and government relations efforts. In a particular way, she was uh, very much involved in the efforts to work with and defend the church's freedom of religion and also particularly for the tremendous work that the bishops did at the time of the passage of the current health care bill. She did a tremendous amount of work on behalf of the bishops, lobbying for, working for um, some of the changes that are, in the end we were not successful in getting. But behind that scene is a whole degree of love for the church, of experience, of work, and of effort. In 2006, she completed studies for a degree in canon law at the Catholic University, which means, yes, she's a canon lawyer as well. She retired from the Bishop's Conference last year, and I'm very pleased that we have someone of this range of experience and particularly of faith to address us this evening. Nancy. Thank you very much, Bishop, for that uh, generous, generous introduction. Uh, you can see from uh, what Bishop Malloy said that uh, I used to be somebody, <laughs> and now I'm not. <laughs> now I'm retired. Um, but I'm very, very happy to be here this evening, and um, I'm just setting this. I'm going to time myself so that I uh, don't go over your time. Um, first, I want to express my thanks to you all for coming uh, this evening. Uh, what an interesting time to be with a group of, of Catholics reflecting on our teaching. Yesterday I arrived in Chicago just when the white smoke came from the Sistine Chapel. And Monsignor Nelson and I were uh, texting each other back and forth because he picked me up. And uh, I was in the jetway waiting for my luggage to come off one of those really small planes, which are a little scary. But anyway, I'm just ready to get my luggage and he texts me and says, white smoke. So I announced to everybody in the jetway, white smoke, and there were actually a number of people that were interested. And then as I walked through the airport, travelers were just riveted to the TV monitors, waiting for the announcement of a new pope. 
I, of course, was caught up in the moment with everybody else, but I have to confess to you that I was also relieved that the announcement was yesterday and not today, because I could imagine all of you would be home in front of your TV watching the new pope, and certainly that's where I would want to be. Bishop Malloy was my boss at the Bishop's Conference, but he was also my sounding board when things looked really bleak, which, if I recall, was about every other day. I would go into his office and say, I don't need advice, I just need to vent. And he would listen patiently to my list of woes. Together we survived the reorganization of the Bishop's Conference, strategic planning, and we almost survived health care reform. And then we both left. And I wonder if those things might be related, because they were some pretty rough times. During the health care debate, having him support me was my salvation. And now that I've retired, we still commiserate, but mostly now about our mutual frustrations with golf and politics. I wish I could tell you some funny stories about Bishop Malloy, but for that, you're going to have to see his mother. He actually has funny stories about me, but fortunately, he didn't tell any of those. We were lucky enough to have him as Associate General Secretary and then Secretary of the Conference, General Secretary of the Conference. Now, when you work at the Bishop's Conference, you usually say that you have 300 bosses. But when you're General Secretary, you're particularly, particularly responsible to the President of the Conference, who in Bishop Malloy's time was Cardinal George. So it's a good thing you didn't burn any of those bridges, because you're right back there. I have no particular expertise on Vatican II, I should tell you. The closest I came was I had a course in ecclesiology um, in my canon law studies with a focus on the council taught by Father Joseph Kamanchak, who actually is an expert in Vatican II, and co-wrote the definitive work on the council. So when Bishop Malloy asked me to do this about six months ago, I thought, why is he asking me? But when someone asks you to do something six months in advance, you usually say, well, sure, and then you worry about it later. So I was actually feeling pretty good about this until I viewed the previous speaker um, on your website, Bishop Murphy, whom I know really well. In his introduction, Bishop Murphy noted that he was a seminarian in Rome at the time of the council. So I said to myself, OK, Bishop Murphy was at the Second Vatican Council trying to get into a session, and I was trying to find my first period Spanish class in high school. Bishop Malloy, what were you thinking? But then as I thought about it more, I realized that I could bring something to this topic. I could bring the practical experience of having had to try to make the hopes and dreams of the Council Fathers on the social doctrine become reality in a very imperfect world with imperfect tools, not to mention the fact that I was a lay person working in the church. Those of us who've had the privilege of working for the church at any level are part of the legacy of the Council and its opening up of the church to the laity. And that is also true of lay people in general, those of you who have leadership positions in the church, as well as those of you who volunteer every day in the parishes and dioceses. As the decree on the apostolate of the laity said, lay people too, sharing in the priestly, prophetical, and kingly office of Christ, play their part in the mission of the whole people of God in the church and in the world. So I will be relying on the work of Father Kamanchak and others who have analyzed the Council documents, and in particular, Gaudium et Spes. My goal this evening really is to lay the groundwork for the discussion that follows this talk, and hopefully to entice you to read Gaudium et Spes if you haven't done it yet. I learned in my research for this talk that the message of Gaudium et Spes continues to be debated at various anniversaries over the past almost 50 years in seminars and series like the ones you are attending. Much of that debate is about whether the Council Fathers were too optimistic about the condition of the world and the ability of the church to have influence over the culture. Others say they were overly cautious. I will touch on these themes later in my presentation. I'm going to divide my talk into four equal parts. Uh, and I don't take, by the way, I don't take any credit for this uh, PowerPoint. My PowerPoint was pathetic looking, and then the people at the diocese fixed it up and made it look nice. First, I'm going to briefly outline how Gaudi et Spes came about and what were some of its unique features. Then I'll focus on the key ideas and themes of the document. In a sense, I will uh, summarize it for you. Third, I'll discuss some of the ways the Universal Church responded to the call of that document for engagement with society. And finally, I will identify some concerns and challenges from my experience, not, not things that are necessarily uh, original to me, but things that I have observed over the years. So how did the bishops prepare for the council? 
and a little bit on the historical context of the time. In a 2002 interview with Just Good Company, Father Kamanchak described the preparation as, quote, unprecedented in its outreach to bishops around the world for their input as to themes and advice. Questionnaires were sent to every, bishops, every bishop, and in response, 9,000 proposals were submitted. Now, while there was no preparatory work for Gaudium et Spes, as you'll see later, there were 10 preparatory commissions appointed to prepare the other documents. So even in its preparation, the desire of Pope John XXIII that this council would not be business as usual was very apparent. Again from Father Kamanchik in a 1990 article in Commonweal Magazine, which commemorated the 25th anniversary of the council, he recalled how the bishops of the United States at the time of the council responded to the call for input. His analysis of their responses and the process says a lot about their expectations and how prepared they were for a very different experience. Generally speaking, the bishops of the world responded in significant numbers. Over 85% of them send in, sent in input. In the US, it was 86, so right about the same. Not surprisingly for the time, the US bishops did not make any effort to collaborate on their responses, even though they had the opportunity to do that at their 1959 and 1960 national meetings. Surprisingly, none of the bishops of the southwestern states focused on the growth of Mexican Americans in their responses. In fact, close to two thirds of the bishops didn't mention any issues of economic, social, political, or cultural significance. Obviously, these topics were not on their minds as they prepared for a Vatican Council because that was not their experience of Vatican Councils of the past. Father Kamanchek goes on to describe three overarching areas of concern in the United States at the time. Church-state relations, race, and the fear of communism. He notes that less than a quarter of the bishops identified church-state relations or religious freedom as a concern. Now, when you realize that a major work on religious liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, emerged from the council, you get a sense of how much development happened in the course of the council process. Secondly, the issue of segregated schools was a major topic of both within the church and the nation as a whole. In 1956, the Bishop of New Orleans, Francis Rommel, declared segregation to be morally wrong, and in 1958, the bishops as a whole condemned segregation in all its forms. However, less than 10% of the US bishops mentioned race. And finally, while the country as a whole was focused on the threat of communism, having just come through the McCarthy hearings, only 20 bishops mentioned communism as a concern. I don't think these statistics show a lack of awareness of of cultural and socioeconomic uh, uh, conditions on the part of the bishops. Rather, I think it reflected their lack of understanding about how, just how different this council would be. They may have heard Pope John XXIII say that he was throwing open the doors and windows of the church and calling for aggiornamento or bringing up to date, but they didn't yet know what that meant. They would soon find out in Gaudium et Spes that there would be a new relationship called for between the church and the modern world, one that focused on more, op more on opportunities than on the threats of the world. Even before the debates over the content of Gaudium et Spes began, it was already a different document from its inception. It was an unusual document in an unusual council. First, the unusual council. Prior to this one, Councils usually were called to address a particular concern or a problem in the church, sometimes a heresy, or to announce a new dogma. So when Pope John XXIII said he wanted to call a council without a specific agenda, that must have come as a surprise to some of the bishops. And some maybe even felt a little uneasy about what he had in mind, like maybe this was going to be a free-for-all. So the council itself was out of the ordinary. Then with respect to Gaudium et Spes, there were also some unique aspects. I read a speech that was given last year by a Dr. Fajol of the University of St. Thomas. His talk was called The Bat Battle Over Gaudium et Spes, Then and Now, Dialogue with the Modern World After Vatican II. He described some of the ways that you'll see up on the screen that, Vatican, that Gaudium et Spes was different from the other Vatican documents. I took his list and I added some others from my research and I came up with this list. 
First, it was a pastoral constitution, not a doctrinal constitution. And that difference influenced the content and the tone of the document. It was the longest document that came out of the council. If you check it on the Vatican website, it's almost 37,000 words. It was also the final document produced by the council. It wasn't completed until January 1965, and then it was even redrafted before it was finally promulgated at the end of that year. The document evolved from the floor of the council. As I said before, there was no prior draft, there was no draft prior to the, com to the uh, council, and therefore it had no, as they called them, preparatory schemas or drafts. It was written not by one subcommission, but by two subcommissions. One, the one that was called theology or doctrine, and the second that was called the laity. Now, the fact that it was written by two committees, you know, we have a joke about that when something's written by committee. And the fact that this was written by two committees may in fact account for its length. <laughs> I've already noted that it was a new kind of document in terms of its subject matter. It addressed new issues as, for example, social and economic justice, peace and war, marriage and family, in light of the signs of the times. It addressed what we call both odd intra and odd extra within the church and without. Gaudium et Spes was written in a new language, at least for Vatican councils. The language was one of dialogue, which was more open to the reader, inviting the reader in, rather than as in some past documents, which were much more proscriptive, or saying, you know, what you should do. There was some tension in the development of Gaudium et Spes among the council fathers about whether it was too optimistic or too pessimistic about the possible relationship between the church and the modern world. The divisions were between the more skeptical Germans and the more optimistic French and Dutch. I think some of us might guess who one of those skeptical Germans might have been. This was referred to as a clash of theolo theological cultures. Now, I hadn't read the document in a long time until I started to prepare for this talk. And I, so I'm reading it now, you know, 50 years after the council ended. I guess if you focus more on the beginning chapters and the enduring themes and principles, such as the dual nature of mankind, the common good, etc., these principles can still be applied to our time and circumstances. When you get to the specific issues, then I think an argument could be made for excessive optimism. Not exactly irrational exuberance, but nevertheless excessive optimism. I would point particularly to the ability of the church to have influence on the culture, and the call for international economic structures. On that point of optimism, a recent book by Thomas Rourke of Clarion University in Pennsylvania contends that the, one of the problems with Gaudium et Spes is its, quote, uncritical acceptance of modern progressivism, which causes Christians to neglect, quote, the necessary distinction between progress conceived politically, economically, and scientifically, and the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. These words were quoted in Russell Shaw's brief review of Rourke's book, The Social and Political Thoughts of Benedict XVI, which appeared in National Catholic Reporter. And of course, among one of the critics is Pope Benedict himself, who at the time was a Pariti, or expert at the council. In his Principles of Catholic Theology, in the chapter entitled, Review of the Postconciliar Era, Failures, Tasks, and Hopes, is what I would say is probably the starkest assessment of Gaudium et Spes and of Vatican II by the future pope, now Benedict Emeritus. Something of the Kennedy era pervaded the council, he said. Something of the naive optimism of the concept of the great society. It was precisely the break in historical consciousness, the self-tormenting rejection of the past that produced the concept of a zero hour in which everything would begin again, and all those things that had formerly begun badly would be done well. Now that may sound a bit harsh, but if you read some of the things that Benedict has said about the council, he was very much concerned that it would be seen as a break with tradition, as sort of a break in the church, so that the church went along to this point, and then there was a break, and it sort of started all over again. And he wanted to very much be clear that that was not what happened. 
The second part of the talk, I'd like to outline, give you an idea of some of the key themes and, um, and phrases in the, in the document. Now, this can get a little tedious if you, hadn't, if you haven't read it, because I'm going to be going through this sort of chapter by chapter. But let's start and see how it goes. The document begins with these words. The joys and hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age, especially the poor, are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. I'm sure by now you know that Vatican documents take their titles usually from the first few words of the document, hence Gaudium et Spes, joys and hopes. But the first sentence also refers to the griefs and the anxieties of the followers of Christ. Archbishop Dermot Martin of Dublin, a longtime Vatican insider, in a talk on the 40th anniversary of Gaudium et Spes, notes that while he knows a number of bishops who take Gaudium et Spes as their motto, he has yet to, t to meet one who takes luctus et angur, the griefs and anxieties, which are also mentioned in the first paragraph. So we have to remember that even though the document is about the joys and hopes, it's also about the griefs and the anxieties that we experience as human beings. Paragraph two, again, paragraph two actually is uh, the place where the theme of the document comes out. For the council yearns to explain to everyone how it conceives of the presence and activity of the church in the world today. The introduction presents two concepts which have become part of church language, the people of God and interpreting the signs of the times in the light of the gospel. In paragraph three, on the people of God, it says, hence giving witness and voice to the faith of the whole people of God gathered together by Christ. This council can provide no more eloquent proof of its solidarity with the entire human family than by engaging with it in conversation about these various problems. Hence, the focal point of our presentation will be man himself, whole and entire, body and soul, heart and conscience, mind and will. In paragraph four then, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the, t t the signs of the times and interpreting them in the light of the gospel. We must therefore recognize and understand the world in which we live, its expectations, its longings, and its often dramatic characteristics. But it also then laments that man painstakingly searches for a better world without compromising spiritual advancement. Now, don't panic. I'm not going to go through this paragraph by paragraph. I just wanted to, to point those out because they are two very key ideas. It's divided, as you can see, into two parts. And part one is called the church and man's calling. I hope no one is offended by the language. I'm using the language that was written 50 years ago. Every now and then I'll remember to say humankind or men and women, but if I don't, please don't be offended. I'm not offended, so you may not be. The dignity of the human person in chapter one focuses on three key concepts. The dual nature of humankind, the concept of true freedom, and the dignity of the human person. The dual nature of man says, therefore, man is split within himself. As a result, all of human life shows it to be something we're very familiar with, the dramatic struggle between good and evil, between light and darkness. It goes on then to say that conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of a person. And only in freedom can a person direct him or herself toward goodness. Now this theme comes out many, many times in the writings of both of the two previous popes. The idea that freedom doesn't mean you do anything you want. True freedom is only when men and women can direct themselves toward goodness. On the dignity of the human person, it says that the church holds that the recognition of God is in no way hostile to men and women's dignity, since this dignity is rooted and perfected in God. And on the community of mankind, the focus is on interdependence and socialization, the concept of the common good and the social obligations of humankind. In that chapter, Paragraph 23 speaks of the growing interdependence of men and women promoted chiefly by modern technology, and this is something certainly that we can relate to. The subject and the goal of all social institutions is and must be the human person who by its very nature stands completely in need of social life. And here they are referring to family and political community, 
associations and organizations, public and private. We, in our language now, would call those mediating institutions, the kind of institutions that are between us, in a sense, and government. On the common good, in paragraph 26, says the sum of these conditions of social life, which allows the sum of these conditions is social life, which allows social groups and their individual members ready access to their fulfillment. It then strongly con condemns those things that are, and, and it uses three examples those that are opposed to life itself, those that violate the integrity of the human person, and those that insult human dignity. Now, I have to think that this was an attempt to distinguish the moral weight of these three different sets of issues. And I'll return to this whole concept of the moral weight of issues later on when I talk about the challenges. It also condemns all forms of communication and applauds those who commit themselves to serving the human community. In chapter three, which is focused on mankind's activity throughout the world, it recognizes how through science and technology, humankind has mastered nearly the whole of nature. But it does not see this as contrary to God's power or a rival to God's power, but instead as a sign of God's grace and the continuation of God's creation. In fact, it states that there is no conflict between science and faith as long as investigation is carried out in a genuinely scientific manner and is in accord with moral norms, because science and faith both derive from the same God. Chapter 4, The Role of the Church in the Modern World, obviously affirms the, the theme of the document and says that the church goes forward together with humanity and experiences the same earthly lot which the rest of the world does. It further states and this is important, I think, in terms of our current context. While the church has no proper mission in the political, economic, or social order, the church can work with all forms of government as long as the government upholds basic rights, the common good, and freedom of religion. Really makes you think when you see where we are right now. It also calls a serious er error any time there is a split between the faith which many profess and their daily lives, we need to bring together our faith and our daily lives. And that is a resounding theme throughout the document. It states that Christians can disagree on specific solutions to the world's problems, and that some of the faithful will disagree. And then it says, no one is allowed, this is in paragraph 43, no one is allowed in the aforementioned situations, that is, specific solutions to the world's problems, to appropriate the church's authority for his or her opinion. In paragraph 44, it talks about the mutual benefit between the church and the world. It recognizes that uh, just as it is in the world's interest to acknowledge the church as a historical reality and to recognize her good influence, so the church herself knows how richly she has profited by the history and the development of humanity. Those, I think, those principles, those sort of ways of looking at our faith and the world and how it comes together, definitely have the same, can be applied to some of our problems of today. When we go on to the second part, some problems of special urgency, not as clear, but we'll go through those anyway. The first certainly is something that we can relate to. Chapter one states that family is the foundation of society and the council wishes to support those who are, quote, trying to preserve the holiness and to foster the natural dignity of the married state. In paragraph 48, a man and a woman who by their compact of conjugal love are no longer two but one flesh, render mutual help and service to each other through an intimate union of their persons. The church supports mothers and fathers in the education of their children, especially religious education. And this is key. Marriage is not constituted solely for procreation, but also the mutual love of the spouses. It then goes on to say that from the moment of conception, life must be guarded with the greatest care, calling abortion and infanticide unspeakable crimes. And here again, thinking of the situation we're in with marriage and the family, paragraph 52 says, since the family is the foundation of society, the public authority, that would be the government, 
should regard it as a sacred duty to recognize, protect, and promote their authentic nature and to shield public morality and favor the prosperity of home life. Would that we had that now. Chapter two is the proper development of culture. This document focuses a lot on the, the, uh, the task of the church to be able to address and confront the culture. The circumstances in the world today, section one, expresses concern about moving ahead and developing culture while at the same time preserving what is good about the past and not leaving behind those who for whatever reason are left out. Now in our time, I would say that refers to the fact that we live in such a rapidly changing technology that we're in danger of losing what is good about the past and becoming a society that constantly responds to the newest technology. Under section two, the principles for the proper development of culture, paragraph 57 says, indeed the danger is present that mankind confiding too much in the discoveries of today may think, may think that he or she is sufficient unto him or herself and no longer seek the higher things. It includes among the higher things, contemplation, making personal judgment, and developing a religious, moral, and social sense. For some urgent duties of Christians in regard to culture, section three, this section contains, contends that one way Christian teaching can influence culture is through education, cultural development, social communication, and the collaboration between those who teach the sacred sciences and those who teach the secular sciences. Of course, the sacred sciences, they're thinking of things like theology and canon law. On the former point about the sacred sciences, Paragraph 62 expresses the hope that many of the laity will study the sacred sciences and will dedicate themselves professionally to these studies. In chapter three, under the economic and social life, there are two subsections that focus on the need for economic balance between the haves and have nots, both with regard to individuals and regard to countries and regions. Section one says that economic development must exist within the limits of the moral order and it also warns against discrimination and treatment of immigrants. Among the principles governing the socio socioeconomic life in section two are the dignity of human labor, freedom to pursue economic opportunity, freedom to organize, the universal destination of earthly goods, and at the same time, the right of private ownership, the preferential option for the poor, and warning against putting workers in involuntary servitude which today I would say manifests itself in human trafficking, both in this country and abroad. It also notes that Christians should take an active part in socioeconomic development and give a shining example by their own lives. Now, chapter four is my favorite chapter. It's the chapter on political authority. And listen carefully, and I don't wanna hear any snickers or sneers from the audience. Political authority must also be exercised within the limits of the moral order and directed toward the common good. The document affirms those in public office and warns that citizens must be careful not to attribute excessive power to public authorities, lessening the role of persons, families, and social groups. We call this the principle of subsidiarity. Then it goes on to say in para paragraph 75, political parties must promote the common good and must, promote, must not promote their interests over those of the common good. And politicians must not pursue materials, material advantages from their office. I think I'll just let that sit there. <laughs> this section also states the independence of the church from the political community or any particular political system. And here is a very critical passage that has special relevance today, and I'm gonna come back to this later. In paragraph 76, it says, the church does not place her trust in the privileges offered by civil authority. She will even give up the exercise of certain rights which have been legitimately acquired if it becomes clear that the use of those rights will take away from her witness. The final chapter speaks of fostering peace and promoting a community of nations. In paragraph 78, it says, Peace is likewise the fruit of love, which goes beyond what justice can provide. I looked at that and I thought, 
You know, maybe we should revise that saying that you've probably all heard, if you want peace, work for justice. Maybe we should say, if you want peace, justice is not enough. Or, as the Beatles would sing, all you need is love. The section on the avoidance of war focuses on the impact of World War II and condemns the methodical extermination of an entire people, nation, or ethnic minority, obviously referring to the Holocaust. It calls for international agreements, affirms conscientious objection, affirms those in military service, and then goes at, on at length to condemn total war and warn of the dangers of the armed race. It envisions a universal authority which would outlaw war by international consent. We're really far from that. I mean, that, that really is something that would, is hard to imagine, although it's, it is idealistic. The final se section in this chapter states that it is absolutely necessary for countries to cooperate more closely together and to organize international organizations which will foster peace. It acknowledges the already existing structures and then in paragraph 86 outlines the norms for cooperation. They include the need for development and not just foreign aid from advanced nations, the regulation of economic relations and international business affairs. It warns against solutions to address the increase in world population that are contrary to moral law. Gaudium et Spes concludes as it began with hope that men and women will be aroused to a lively hope, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that someday at last they will be caught up in peace and utter happiness, radiant with the glory of the Lord. In looking at the response to Gaudium et Spes, and I, I do have to tell you that um, this won't surprise you, anything that happened in the church after Vatican II was said to have come from Vatican II. So, Everybody takes credit, but I tried to pick out some things that certainly, you know, that, that, that followed in the, in the sense of the documents. One of the really good responses of the Universal Church was the establishment of the Council on Justice and Peace by Pope Paul VI in 1967. In Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 90, proposed that, considering the immensity of the hardships which still afflict the greater part of humankind today, an organism of the universal church should be set up in order that both the justice and love of Christ toward the poor might be developed everywhere, and where the Catholic community would be stimulated to foster progress in needy regions and social justice on the international scene. As you heard from Bishop Malloy, I was privileged to be a member of the council. I think it was in the 1990s. And the council has produced major documents that carried forth the content and spirit of the council particularly Gaudium et Spes. Perhaps the Council is best known for the series of World Day of Peace statements. The commemoration of the World Day of Peace began in 1968 and continues to this day. The World Day of Peace statement for 2013, chosen by Benedict, was, Blessed are the Peacemakers. Bishop William Murphy of Rockville Center, who I mentioned earlier, your previous speaker, worked at the Justice and Peace Council. In fact, we used to say that when Bishop Murphy worked there, we always got the World Day of Peace statement in time that we could actually do something with it. No offense to the Italians, but he was a lot better at it. <laughs> During Bishop Murphy's time, the council also produced a statement on the guidelines for teaching seminarians about justice and peace issues. And in 2004, the council produced the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church which renewed and updated the social teaching of the church based in Gaudium et Spes. It is a kind of catechism, if I may use that word, of social teaching. Besides the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, there was another major event that affirmed Gaudium et Spes, and that was the special synod of bishops in 1985, marking the 20th anniversary of the council. It recognized that the signs of the times are different with increasing problems of hunger, oppression, injustice, and terrorism regarding requiring a much more profound theological reflection. A key structure called for by the Council, that was the document called Christus Dominus, was the Episcopal Conference, Conference of Bishops. 
In more recent times, Episcopal conferences in individual countries or groups of countries have served as a vehicle for the church to engage with government. Now, that's not all they do. They're mostly a federation of bishops. They work pastorally. But even in other countries, you often read about the conference of bishops somehow engaging the, the uh, government of a country. In the US, the Catholic War Council which was the precursor of the, of the conference, was established in 1917. It eventually became the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, United States Catholic Conference in 1966. In 1968, the US bishops established a National Advisory Council, which is composed of bishops, clergy, religious, and laity, who represent the 15 regions of the United States as a kind of church in miniature, offering advice and counsel to the bishops. As I mentioned, the, the Episcopal Conference in this country was divided into two bodies, the United States Catholic Conference and the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. One was an in, sort of inside the church uh, structure, and the other was the public policy arm. Each had committees of bishops and staff who carried out the work of the conference. And then the two arms of the conference were officially joined in 2001 to create what we have now, which is the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB. Now, the primary way in which the current USCCB interacts with society in the US is through the political process. Advocating for change through legislation is seen as a necessary way for the church to try to influence society. And other religious organizations have established similar structures to bring their concerns to the attention of policymakers. Uh, early on in my work, there was a process within Catholic Charities, which was called the Cadre Study, and that also resulted in more focus on advocacy in government policies. Catholic Relief Services, well known for its relief work in many countries throughout the world, began to shift its focus to development, as called for in Gaudium et Spes, and eventually embraced advocacy as a strategy, and now has a very robust presence on Capitol Hill. In the individual states, Bishops of the state coordinate their advocacy efforts under the state Catholic conferences like you have here in Illinois. There are 38 such Catholic conferences, and they interact regularly with governors and state legislatures. Current issues that state conferences are taking up include life and marriage issues, education, and threats to human dignity, such as hunger and homelessness. Advocacy for public policies that promote Catholic principles typically involve identifying issues for the bishops of the country or the state, and then seeking opportunities to testify before congressional committees or send letters to them at the federal level or here in your houses in the individual states. What has been added to that process over the past 25 years is more of a grassroots element that can be activated when there is a particular piece of legislation to be supported or opposed. And again, you have that kind of process here in Illinois through your own Catholic conference. While this effort has been effective on certain pieces of legislation, nationally and locally, some critics have raised issues with regard to some aspects of the process of relying on, le on legislation. And I'd like to outline a couple of those aspects, and some of them might sound familiar to you. The first is the breadth of the agenda that's identified by the various public policy committees. And I'll, I'll take this from the perspective of the Bishops' Conference. I'm sure something similar happens at the state. Let me mention some of those. Abortion and life issues, communications, domestic policy, education, immigration and refugee issues, international justice and peace, marriage and family life, and religious liberty concerns. And each one of those has many sub-issues, as you can imagine. And there's a committee of bishops that monitors each of those areas. Now, with that broad of an agenda, the bishops on the national level are sometimes almost daily reacting to legislation. So the logical answer might seem to be prioritize the issues. But since each committee of the conference has its own priorities, Committees have a hard time prioritizing within their own committee. Prioritization among committees is a much more difficult process. It's very difficult to, oh, that tells me I'm coming close. That leads me to the second and rela related challenge, which I mentioned before, the comparative moral weight of the issues. Now, traditionally, this challenge has been characterized as pro-life versus social justice. Unfortunately, in some quarters of the church, 
Groups identified with either set of issues have caused division and dissension. Some of you will remember that there was an effort in the 1980s from Cardinal Bernadine of Chicago called bringing the issues together under a consistent ethic of life. Now, that may have been a good theological construct, but it was a terrible political strategy. And that was because some Catholics and Catholic politicians hijacked the effort by arguing that what this showed was that all issues are of the same weight and they could choose which issues to support or oppose and still be in union with the church, which we know is not true. Another related concern is the issue of specificity. And that is the extent to which bishops get involved in every issue and whether or not some of those issues could have various sides where people could disagree. And if you recall from my summary of Gaudi et Spes, the document says that, that there are certain ranges of issues where it would be helpful if people discussed those and sort of came to their own conclusions. Now the difficulty there is where do you make the line of demarcation between issues where the church must be involved and issues where people of goodwill could disagree. You saw in the healthcare debate, when there is a life issue, it's an easy decision to make. When it's another issue that has a life issue within it, then we get the fractures. So there has been a question whether the emphasis on legislation is itself appropriate when so many of the most vexing issues have deep cultural roots. And as I mentioned before, Gaudi Metzbez places particular emphasis on the development of culture. The current debate about marriage is about culture. We have to figure out a way to take on the culture and to continue to be what we are in most cases, which is a countercultural people. And I'll give you two good examples. The pro-life movement is a countercultural movement. The current effort to end the use of the death penalty is a countercultural movement. So the challenge is for the church to be engaged with the culture, but not controlled by the culture. On marriage, some say that we've already lost considerable ground on this issue. Recovering that ground will take a major cultural shift, particularly with the media, which has embraced same-sex relationships in movies, TV sitcoms and dramas, and even commercials. Finally, I'd like to talk about the challenge of the laity and getting the laity to be involved. In the 50 years since the council, we've seen an explosion of ecclesial lay ministry, and it has enriched our church in countless ways. The bishops, in fact, wrote a, a document called Coworkers in the Vineyard of the Lord, which recognizes and infer, affirms the great work of ecclesial lay ministry. But what I haven't seen is a comparable engagement of lay Catholics as laity in their various roles in society. This is something that's a little more common in Europe for example, there is a community called St. Egidio, which is a lay organization formed in 1968, headquartered in Italy, in 70 countries with 60,000 members. There just isn't anything like that in the United States. The church doesn't have this kind of a tradition. It has, in the years that I've worked in the church, there have been various efforts to organize laity. What tends to happen is the laity, when organized, then want to bring about change in the church rather than change in the culture. Now, there, is, there has been some improvement in this. Um, let me point to two organizations, one, um, called, the, uh, one called Legatus, which for 25 years has provided an environment for its members to become ambassadors for the Catholic faith, and the other called the Catholic Association of Latino Leaders, which is a recently organized group that seeks to share the truths of the gospel and the values of Latino culture. But in my own mind, the jury is still out on how best to engage the laity in reflecting on their role as lay Catholics and the culture. The final challenge, which I've alluded to without, throughout here, is the challenge of the relationship with government. Many of our institutions, as you know, rely on government particularly for their uh, financial support. And those who establish these institutions, whether they be education, um, social services, hospitals, many years ago probably did some time, did so at a time when governments were more tolerant of faith-based institutions. So they willingly accepted government partnership and support since it did not in interfere with their ministries. We're no longer at that point now. We no longer have governments that are friendly to faith-based organizations and are willing to allow us to do those services and still uh, remain faithful to our mission. 
So let me go back to that quote. Gaudi Metzbez warned that the church should not place her trust in the privileges offered by civil authority, and she should not take advantage of that, even if it becomes clear that their use will cast, and should not take advantage of that, if it becomes clear that their use will cast doubt on the sincerity of her witness. So the church may now have to evaluate how it funds and supports its health, educational, and social services in light of the current threats to religious liberty. Obviously, all of these challenges could not have been anticipated by the writers of, the Gaudi, of Gaudium et Spes. But when the writers said that the church must examine the signs of the times and interpret them in the light of the gospel, they anticipated that the signs of the times would change with each generation, but the gospel message would remain the same. And so in conclusion, I would like to thank you for allowing me to express some of my own thinking in the context of this topic. While I confess that I don't have the answers to those neuralgic issues and those challenges that I laid before you, I hope I've sparked some of your own thinking as you continue to live out this year of faith. Thank you very much. Okay. She said she didn't have experience in Gaudium et Spes. <laughs> I think you can see why uh, I made the effort to bring Nancy in for such a wide-ranging and a practical and a faithful and a loving explanation of one of the most important and frankly one of the most discussed documents of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, I have to say that I think this talk just fully uh, met the expectations and uh, we're very, very grateful. We have about 20 minutes and uh, the thought would be to throw open the floor for questions for Nancy to answer. Um, anything that may have sparked your uh, thoughts, your questions, um, your reflections here. Uh, Father McMorrow has a microphone. If you just raise your hand, and he would uh, be happy to bring the microphone over to, for uh, any questions. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll just stick with one. Um, the Italian organization of laity that you mentioned, what do they do? What is the nature of the organization? Actually, I think Bishop Malloy knows a little bit more about it than I do, but um, they are an example of lay people who, because they actually started, uh, let me just start, they actually started in a part of Rome called Tristevere, and they come together for reflection on their role as laity uh, and prayer and evangelization. And they have actually um, gotten involved as an organization in some of the hottest spots in the world in praying and hoping for peace. So I guess I use them as an example of a group of laity coming together, not necessarily by profession, like they're not all lawyers, they're not all doctors, they're not all whatever, teachers, but they do reflect on their own lives, they pray, and they study together, and then they take action. And I use them as an example because that's something I think that is much more common to Europe because now they're spread out all over Europe than it is in this country. We just don't. We, we have that in little places, but we don't have it as something that, for example, you know, you could join anywhere you live in the United States. Is that okay? You said you had other, you said you had other questions? Um, yes, I was an RCI director for about 25 years in the diocese, and what I noticed among Catholics is we had then the Renew program going, and it, was, it started out as being a wonderful thing mm -hmm. because it did what it was supposed to do, but then I was um, struck by the idea of what you said, then it goes from that from something else, and they don't even recognize it because... <laughs> What I, what I figured out myself, and it didn't work at all, was that a couple of years after people went through RCIA and were getting involved in the church and such, or getting more, um, becoming more a part of the church, 
putting them into some of these groups, these RCIA groups. And I, I contacted six groups, and five of them said, we're comfortable the way we are. We don't want anyone else in. And of course, after Renew, of course, came evangelization. Um, and the people who've gone through RCIA quite often are the best evangelizers. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just seemed like they got stuck of their own idea of what they should do in their faith. Right. And I think that happens, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Quite often to all of us, even, yeah. from time to time. But One um, of the things that, uh, that I uh, sort of came across in discussions over the years is that people who would get together or, be, or try to get together as laity would say that the church doesn't have what they called a theology of work. It doesn't have sort of a, a, a theology, uh, not just a theology of lay people, but a theology for people to sort of reflect on what they do in their daily lives. And that's very much a part of this document. If you recall, one of the, as we were going through the, um, the summary, it says that there shouldn't be a division between people's lives and their faith. Now, I'm not a theologian, so I don't know what a theology of work would look like. But if it's something that would help, then, you know, I'd be all for it, obviously. Hi. Uh, you had an interesting comment where you, you uh, were reflecting on the... Digital. Just one? Uh, well, what I was going to comment on in the, uh, <laughs> in the question I had. Uh, you, you, you noted that the, uh, following Gaudium Spes, there's, there's been difficulty in terms of um, bringing uh, laity into the church and like a sort of the, the, the distinction between having the laity sort of uh, try to change the culture versus changing the church. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could speak more to that. In particular, um, I was wondering if there's something idiosyncratic about uh, American culture that makes that uh, particularly difficult for Americans to sort of join organizations like that without sort of trying to change them. I, I you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I can give you one. I can give you one recent example. Um, th there was an ex there was an um, an effort in the past two elections to organize Catholics, but unfortunately. Those organizations were very partisan. They were very, they were from for one party or another. So, if I reflect on that, you know, I sort of say to myself, maybe it's just that we are so divided now, and such a divided country, and that our politics is so coarse and so partisan that you can't get people to sort of join together. They want to look at what divides them rather than what brings them together. Now, that also may be. You know, coming out of the Washington experience, that may just be my experience from that. But that's sort of what I saw. And that was really a shame because at those times uh, in our history, every four years, at least for, for us Catholics, with some of the documents that the bishops have put out, it's a great opportunity to be able to reflect on some of the principles of Catholic teaching. But immediately, it divided. I don't know, that doesn't really answer your question, but it's as... You mentioned earlier that there were, uh, that, or you know of no example of the American bishops getting together for the Second Vatican Council. Do you know of any other countries where the, the national group of bishops got together and presented a joint paper there? I don't. I don't. I just. I just found that out about the American bishop. I don't. Do you? No. The other question I have is uh, near the beginning of your talk, you you were somewhat apologetic about using original words uh, that uh, were, may not be politically correct or something. And as of late, I've noticed this in several talks I've had with people. Or, uh, but, you know, attended talks where people gave, and that seems to be the attitude. And I'm wondering because. In your own talk, some of the strongest statements, the truest statements you made, were direct quotations from the from the Gaudium and Spes. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why why are we so inhibited by saying what's true anyway? Well, it doesn't offend me, but sometimes when you're speaking, people hear that and it sort of it sort of grates a little bit. And I just wanted to make sure that you know people felt comfortable. But you're right, you win. <laughs> I just wondered, 
as a group as Catholics, we're put in a position where we're fighting now the president, our governor, the mayor of Chicago, all on gay marriage, same-sex marriage, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's becoming a disease, disease or a culture. Uh, we're fighting Hollywood or, or TV personnel with Modern Family, uh, the new normal. They're mad, trying to make it sound like this is the way it is. How, how are we going to fight this as a group? That's what I'd like to know. Do you have an answer? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't have an answer, but, um, but, uh, but I do have this reflection. In fact, uh, Bishop Malloy and I were just talking about this. Um, I mentioned the, uh, I mentioned those two, I, I mentioned those two examples, the death penalty and um, pro-life area, as areas where, if you think about it, um, I mean, we didn't start out where we ended up on pro-life, where really we have changed the culture. I mean, if you're, and I know you have some local things here, but like if you're in Washington, they can say what they want to about not being able to count the people there. But there are hundreds of thousands of people there, and they're mostly young. That's the key. They're mostly young. So in that sense, we really have turned the culture around. And I also use the example of the death penalty, because on the death penalty, I mean, there are a number of states now that are, and, and you have to be careful about this in Catholic teaching, not doing away with the death penalty, but ending the use of the death penalty, which does fit within Catholic teaching. That's another countercultural counter movement. We didn't, we didn't start there. That took a lot of work. I guess my question is, you know, we've, as I said, we've lost a lot of ground on the marriage and family issue. But my hope is that now that we have engaged it, at the national level and in the states, that we can have that same kind of turnaround in the culture. But the reason I used it as an example is because I don't think it can be done through legislation. You know, hopefully you won't, your legislation won't pass here, but it'll come back. So I don't think you can do it through legislation. We didn't change legislation yet in pro-life, but we have a countercultural movement that is strong and everyone knows that it has to be respected. It's my hope, anyway, that the same kind of thing will happen in this area. That's all I can offer you. I heard it stated now that uh, the pro-life movement started out trying to get a change in the courts. And now we're winning in the legislatures. On and in the streets. Yeah. And I, think, I think that's the critical part. I'm wondering after the uh, problems that the health care mandate has caused for organizations like Catholic Charities um, in counseling and so on, uh, are there still opportunities for, for an organization like Catholic Charities to work together with the government to address the problems of like uh, homelessness and hunger and so on? There are. Um, I had an example in my talk, but I ran out of time. I don't know whether you heard in the last uh, about year, maybe year and a half, the Migration Refugee Services at the Bishops' Conference, which had a huge, I mean, multi-million dollar contract to serve the victims of uh, trafficking, which is a huge problem now and, and, and one that they were doing very good work in. They lost that contract because the Health and Human Services said that in order, they do it on a point system, and they said that uh, the advantage would be to organizations that provided the full range of services, healthcare, or reproductive services, and of course, we don't and we can't, and so they lost that grant. Now, homelessness, uh, housing, those areas, it all depends on how things go. I mean, they wouldn't be affected so much by the HHS mandate if the Defense of Marriage Act falls then that will have implications for a lot of things. For example, how you place people in housing. So it depends. I mean, you know, it, it, it's still a religious liberty 
problem. It's not so much the HHS problem, but it might end up being a DOMA problem. Um, what you said about the pro-life movement is um, exactly true from everything I've seen. Um, the, the most pro-life group in the country are you know, people under the age of 30 or 25, if you look at polls. Um, but it's the exact opposite when it comes to things like gay marriage, same-sex marriage. Um, and, and so I guess I, I kind of came along and, and I remember the church was very much pro-life and you know, I remember teachers, that was something every year uh, we talked about in Catholic schools. Um, you know, and, and gay marriage is really this very new issue. So. What can we take from the pro-life movement and how can we apply it to gay marriage to get the same kind of results um, given that when I look at those polls from the 70s, young people were the most pro-choice and 40 years later it's, it's completely reversed itself. That's really a good question for Bishop Malloy. <laughs> but one thing, one thing that I, I heard, uh, I was at the Bishop's Conference last, the week before last and uh, they're going to start a march. Now I'm not going to say that a march is the answer to every question, but maybe it is witness. So that's one thing, at least, that I know of. I don't know if you want to take on the hard ones. <laughs> again, uh, we're at 8 o'clock, and we wanted to conclude at this point. A real word of thanks again, uh, Father McMorrow, for uh, everything that's been done here. To all of you who have come out again to the staff of the conference, uh, this has been uh, just an excellent evening. And I think even the discussion here afterward has shown just how practical the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, particularly in this document, is. I hope we all have the opportunity to read it and to uh, follow on again. Nancy made the point that we owe a great deal of uh, gratitude to our uh, Holy Father, particularly for being chosen yesterday uh, instead of today. Uh, I thought uh, one thing that we're going to do is Monday night, at the cathedral in Rockford is to have a mass in celebration and gratitude for the selection of the Holy Father. His pontificate officially begins with the inaugural mass on Tuesday. So um, if you have the opportunity, look at your schedule uh, 5.30 in the evening at the cathedral. In the meantime, why don't we conclude just with prayers for our Holy Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I know there's some goodies there in the background for a little uh, social opportunity afterward. Thanks to everybody for coming. Nancy is around. If anybody would like to have a chat with her. <laughs>